Hi, everybody, and welcome back to this week's Fossil Friday Chats. Uh, I'm Brittany Stoneberg from the Western Science Center. As always, with me is Gabriel Santos from the ALF Museum of Paleontology. Hi, everybody. Happy Tie Day. <laughs> yes, it is October, so we decided to dress up a little. And uh, today, we are going to learn all about the uh, geology paleontology of West Virginia with Nick Gardner. Hi, Nick. Hi. <laughs> Good to see you. Welcome to the show. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited about this. I've never um, I've never been to West Virginia, although I would really like to at some point. And so I'm very excited about learning um, more about the things that you can find there. Um, so a little bit about Nick. Uh, he's a staff librarian at WVU Potomac State College. He earned his bachelor's degree studying ecology and evolution from Marshall University and is published in the Anatomical Record, Paleontological Electronica, and PLOS One. He now uses that expertise to work with community uh, college students, helping them build their own research skills. So, um, Nick, I'm really interested in learning more about how uh, you as a librarian um, work with paleontology. I think this is really cool. Oh, cool. Well, we could probably get into that in the Q and the A. Uh, okay. It's more cool. uh, translating the skills from being a science student um, and giving an advantage to when you're working with students in the different areas. Yeah. Um, so, I'm gonna try to avoid umming. <laughs> All right. Oh, and, so... uh, oh, one quick thing, everybody. Like, uh, like Nick said, if you have any questions, we will have a Q and A afterwards. So go ahead and put those questions in the chat, and we will ask afterwards after the presentation. All right, Nick, whenever you're ready. Okay, cool. All right, so uh, I am Nick Gardner. Uh, I am the staff librarian at Potomac State College. Uh, this is my email address if you want to get a hold of me, as well as my Twitter if you want to see uh, angry tweeting about open science and West Virginia uh, COVID numbers. So, but we're not going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about West Virginia's wonderful fossil past. As was mentioned before, uh, I was a paleontology student as an undergrad. But at the time, I didn't, even though I, my family's from West Virginia and I have lived in West Virginia probably more years than anywhere else, I didn't really appreciate its fossil past till about maybe five years ago or so. Um, as a staff librarian and roles before that, we try to make use of outreach to the community. And since this is an area that I've continued to be interested in, a lot of what we do is fossil-based outreach. All right, so where we're gonna be able to give an overview uh, we're going to talk about the first fossils found in West Virginia. Then we're going to take a short journey through the past, and we're actually going to go backwards from youngest to oldest, which I know is not the way most people like to think of it. And then we're going to talk about the future of uh, where things could go for West Virginia paleontology. All right. So what are the first fossils I think a lot of people don't realize were um, the fossils of megalonyx, which was first described by Thomas Jefferson, our third vice president, then he was the vice president, as the remains of a fossil lion. Uh, it was later recognized about three years later uh, by Casper Whisper as belonging to a ground sloth. Um, and actually it's named after, Tom and the species name is named after Thomas Jefferson. So it's Megalonyx uh, Jefferson I. Uh, one quick note here, the, the material was found in uh, Haynes Cave, not Oregon Cave. That's uh, a bit of a interesting uh, urban legend that went out and around. Uh, so, all right. So again, it, it was uh, correctly identified as a ground sloth. I've got some nice pictures of ground sloth skeletons here, uh, as well as me in front of a retmotherium at the Charleston Museum of South Carolina, which is not in the same family as megalonyx, but it just gives you a sense of the size and scale of these animals. They're just wonderful. Uh, I mentioned Oregon Cave and uh, Hayes Cave. Um, one of the things I just want to point out that West Virginia has a wonderful cave faunas. Uh, Oregon Cave, you can actually go in and visit. Uh, it's uh, just south of Lewisburg off I-64. I think it's about 10 miles south of there. Uh, there's a lot of other caves. Haynes Cave, where megalonyx was found, you can't actually go into. But these cave faunas typically represent the Pliocene and Pleistocene. So it, it, there's, they definitely, I'm going to talk a little bit after this, and it'll shed some light on more of the faunas that are there. All right. Now, as I mentioned, actually, as of uh, 2008, um, Megalonyx Jefferson I was named the state's fossil. This is around the time it was actually started at Marshall University. 
Um, and I did not really know this story then, and I didn't even know what happened then, so I feel kind of bad. All right. I'm not going to focus too much on the Cenozoic, but uh, I mentioned that there's a diverse plio Pleistocene fauna in West Virginia, and a lot of these are in cave deposits, although some of these are also coming up in different alluvial deposits, typically on farmland. Um, in the earliest ones, you actually see things like cheetahs and other big cat species like jaguars, uh, as well as tapirs, um, caribou, all kinds of cool things like that, as well as pikas. Once you hit the Pleistocene, you still can't hang on to some of your smaller species. Uh, there's fossil elephants. Uh, again, all this stuff is known from very scant remains. Nothing's uh, super well preserved. Uh, actually, the Cumberland Bone Cave, which is about 20 minutes north of me in Maryland, has produced some phenomenal specimens, which are on display in the Smithsonian. Uh, but they're part of the same cave system. And actually, the Smilodon mount that you see here used to be in the Smithsonian. They've remounted, and I don't have pictures of the new mount. Uh, you see a lot of the same fauna that we would actually have today, such as black bears, gray foxes, um, as well as you would have, and things like mountain lions were around until about the late 1800s. Same with the pine martin has been, unfortunately, driven to extinction in our state. We also have fossils of small mice and uh, things you see modernly as well. All right. So... The time, the, when we think about a geological time, this is kind of where we're going now into the uh, overview of the past. Um, a lot of the time that usually what we think about as paleontologists, the public is interested in, is only about 11% of the total geological time on the age of Earth, which for me is just personally mind-blowing. And when we think about West Virginia, it's even smaller. It's only about 5% of geological time. Again, there's Pleistocene uh, with the very partial remains. It's that little tiny sliver right there. And then the rest of it is all Paleozoic rocks uh, that range from the mid-lower Cambrian to the early Permian. Um, unfortunately, we have no Mesozoic uh, sedimentary rocks in West Virginia. There are a couple thing places in Pendleton County, and it's all on private land. Uh, I've actually tried to go out to where the stuff is, and there's there's nothing out in the public area. So, all right. So oh, again, I mentioned that you know almost everything that is sedimentary in West Virginia is Paleozoic in age. We're going to go through the six sections, or sorry, the six periods from youngest to oldest. Uh, now, we'll, I'll mostly be talking about Carboniferous, Devonian, Ordovician because that's where the most fossils that I've personally collected are from, as well as where I've spent the most time walking around. Um, so, actually, this is a really like slide deliberately. Uh, there. Permian of West Virginia actually covers most of northern and uh, western West Virginia. However, a lot of that material is not exposed, or sorry, a lot of the rocks are not exposed, and a lot of stuff's on private land. Uh, we've gotten lucky a couple times in the past. Uh, some of the first things that were ever found were these wonderful trackways representing uh, Dimetrodon and probably something similar to Diadectes. The fossil print is called Limnopus. Uh, they were found down in Ritchie County, as well as this whole host of fossils that were collected by the Carnegie, representing everything from spiny sharks to lungfish, uh, things like megalichthys, which are those kind of weird between um, between uh, you know fish and tetrapods, as well as some examples of early modern fish like uh, paleontosaurids. Uh, we have a lot of great amphibian remains. Actually, anyone who here has ever seen Diploceras or Diploceraspis, which is related to um, Diplocolis, it's the boomerang-shaped uh, or boomerang-shaped head uh, amphibian that's shown here, as well as a really nice skull of Eriops, some crappy remains of uh, Branchiosaurid uh, amphibians, and a lot of uh, Lycerophids, which are these really elongate. Um, stem tetrapods. We're not 100% sure if they're amphibians or if there's something that's sitting out of the stem earlier than that. Uh, by the early Permian, there's, most of them are still really small, but there's an amazing giant one called uh, Megamol uh, Gophus. It's actually almost four feet long and has a jaw that's something like six to eight inches long. And all this stuff was described by, by Romer in the 1950s. As, and then we get to terrestrial uh, reptiles and amphibians and mammals, or sorry, the stem mammals, things like Demetrodon and Daphosaurus. Uh, we have examples of protorytherids, which are really close to uh, the kind of animals I worked on as an undergrad. 
And so it's just this nice diversity of material. Unfortunately, a lot of the areas where people did collect, the quarries have since shut down or they've been demolished. Uh, so people are really trying to find new outcroppings, new grow cuts where this material can be collected. Uh, at least as uh, recently as 2015, some effort has been made in Wood County, that's close to Ohio, to collect more terrestrial permian or permian material out there. I know they've found some adaphosaur material as well as material similar to Dometrodon out there. So, all right. Next, we go into the Carboniferous. Uh, there's a lot of Carboniferous exposures my way. It's primarily Pennsylvanian. There is some Mississippian, but it isn't well exposed on the road cuts. And the Pennsylvania material we have is terrestrial or uh, near shore environments. So we have a lot of fantastic fossil plants. As you can see, these are all ferns that I've collected in the area. And you can see this is actually a abandoned coal mine in that middle picture. Now there are several of these throughout my county. Uh, there was one that has wonderful fossils. It's actually where the one that you see in the upper right and the lower left came from. It is that site has actually in an attempt to reclaim it for future farming has been completely bulldozed down. So I don't know what potential we're gonna look at in the future for ever getting more fossils from there. It's really unfortunate because we know in these kind of Pennsylvanian um, terrestrial slash terrestrial marginal environments are where we've been finding where things in the past were found, you know, some of the Pennsylvanian lysorophids and other fossil amphibians, et cetera. And so anytime we lose a site like this, it's, it's just unfortunate. Uh, you guys had Nate Van Vrack, another Pennsylvanian area we get into. Uh, is down in the Allegheny series. It's a little bit earlier, than, or sorry, a little, yeah, a little bit earlier than anything that's in the Konama uh, to uh, Monogalia series. Um, well, the reason I tend to use the series nomenclature when referring to things is because a West Virginia's stratigraphy is not super well understood in these areas. So it's a nice handy shortcut for saying it's sort of roughly in this time period, but we're not 100%. This site, uh, is on a road cut and it's exposed some wonderful ferns as you can see there as well as horsetails, uh, bark, etc. And actually you can see Nate up there uh, standing next to a two feet thick uh, coal layer. All right now the area that would be it is really where a lot of work needs to be done for more exploration in the Carboniferous in West Virginia is the Mississippian exposures. Uh, in West Virginia most of the sites that I'm aware of that are produced uh, t fossil tetrapods are post Romer's Gap. Romer's Gap refers to a time period in the early Mississippian where we're really kind of missing a lot of tetrapod fossils. We know stuff before. Uh, that's when you see a lot of those fishapod type things like Ichthyostega, Canthostega, et cetera. And then, you know, about 20, 25 million years later, you start to see things like the anthracosaurs, your early ancestors of your modern amphibians early ancestors of both mammals and reptiles. Um, so it's really this missing time period. Um, unfortunately, most of the West Virginia exposures probably can't inform too much about that, but they do actually touch right into the area right after Romer's Gap. So we have a lot of great fossils, including what was found in Greer, West Virginia. Unfortunately, this is another quarry that has since been closed and shut down, but it produced the beautiful fossils of Gurupaton which are on display at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. If you ever get the chance to go, uh, they have a wonderful um, aggregation of them that has something like three different individuals in it, as well as a separate one. And this site wasn't just, uh, you know, early tetrapods. It also included lungfish, uh, crinoids, fossil plants. And the fact that these fossil plant environments have a lot of the same plants that we see in those Pennsylvania sites I showed you makes me hopeful that if people kept working on the Pennsylvania sites, there's a chance of turning up more fossil tetrapod material there. All right. Now, the other thing earlier than this, and this is uh, also some, uh, this is early into the beginning of Romer's Gap. This is down the Southern part of the state in Mercer County. I had no idea that the potential to yield these kind of fossils could happen. This is a gorgeous fossil fish that's, that's very closely related to uh, the ancestors of modern fish uh, called blue fieldius. And unfortunately the specimen is now deposited out at the uh, University of Kansas, but 
It's just absolutely beautiful. It's well articulated. I actually was on vacation down in southern West Virginia a few years back and collected very close to this site. Unfortunately for me, all I found was this toid fossil. Uh, blastoids are a type of echinoderm, like sea stars and sea lilies and all, all that. All right. And that takes us into the Devonian. Uh, Devonian is another area where I'm going to kind of spend a lot more time on. Very well-preserved area for where I, or sorry, very well-preserved in my area. Now, these are all plant chunks. Everything you see that's uh, dark black or gray are plant leaves, plant material. It's all pretty uh, much preserved. It's just hashiness inside the blocks. It's very chopped up. But these are some of the oldest land plants in West Virginia. And actually, some of the, uh, the one of the interesting things is there's a, one of the earliest fossil seeds that was known is, was found in Randolph County, West Virginia. It belongs to a seed fern called uh, Echo, yeah, Alkinsia. And that's on display at the State Museum in Charleston, West Virginia. All right. When you go a little bit further from the Hampshire Formation, which is, I should have mentioned this, it's a terrestrial red bed. Um, underneath of it is the Brailler Formation, the Harrell Shale. They're not well divided in our state. Uh, more work needs to be done. You find wonderful things like brachiopods, straight shell, as well as these, uh, set, you see a lot of uh, nautiloid fossil type things like this. And there's a lot of interesting trace fossils. Um, they're definitely traces, not ripple cracks. Uh, the State Geological Survey is looking for more examples of these. So if you live in West Virginia and you can find and collect this kind of stuff and send pictures or send it in, that would be really, really helpful to them. All right, you go a little bit uh, further. There's the Montongo Formation. Now, this is a really, these are coming from a really, really well-known site near Wardensville. So I don't feel bad about sharing where that's at. This is one, probably one of the most heavily over-collected areas in West Virginia. The Montongo's in the early middle Devonian. And the, the wonderful Mucrospirifer that's up in the corner up here, it's a type of brachiopod. And this trilobite weren't collected by me. They were actually collected by James Bo or sorry Max Bovis, who is a great guy. He's part of Dinosaur Park out in uh, Prince George's County, Maryland. And anyone who knows him knows he just has an absolute nose for fossils. Anytime I've been out with him, whether at the Dinosaur Park or here in West Virginia, it's it's wonderfully infuriating how quickly he can find a fossil. Uh, and then you know my big find of the day is that little tabulate coral that's right here. So. Now, closer to me, Eurysthenes sandstone, that's where you start to get to the early middle Devonian. Uh, there is a wonderful Eurysthenes layer that actually has a lot of unconsolidated sediment. And so I find quite often find a lot of brachiopods, crinoids, wonderful things called uh, platyserratid snails like this right here. And you, can, I've got a detailed picture right here that shows you can actually see where some of the shell has fossilized and is still adhering to the cast of the fossil. Uh, Platyserratid snails are interesting because they're often found in association with crinoids or sea lilies. This picture right here really shows this off really well. And they tend to hang out around the anal vent of the crinoid. And what they, it's often suspected is that they were actually feeding on the waste material that was coming off the crinoid. So they were coprophagus or, you know, poop eating. It's really cool. Um, there's some consolidated material here that's collected that's kind of low in the formation. You can see it's just got a lot of great brachiopods. Uh, I know that it's a riskany, that it's that it's into the Devonian because you see these wonderful spirifurids in it. There's some crinoid rings right there as well. One of the perks of collecting along road cuts is you often also get a chance to find modern bones. This is a cannon bone from a young deer. And this is just another nice spirifurid fossil from that same uh, deposit. Uh, so the whole section's probably, I'd say, maybe about 100 feet wide. So, all right, so this is some stuff that we've collected in the mid-Devonian, or sorry, the early Devonian to the earliest mid-Devonian. Uh, this is a site that's opened up thanks to the Appalachian uh, Roadways Commission. It's work on Corridor H. So we get these wonderful bryozoans right here, as well as you can see some corals mixed into this, and these are more coral coming out through here. These are from these, everything that's right here is from the earlier half of the section. Uh, this is starting to get into the Huntersville chert. Um, there's a very thin lens of the Oriskany out here, but it's not well exposed. 
So that's where this brachiopod's from is the Huntersville shirt above that. But this site, um, we've joked that it's sort of Valhalla for crinoids. You can see here there's a wonderfully well-preserved, for, especially for West Virginia, where we usually find only rings or uh, little arm ring, little either the stock rings or arm rings. And we've got a fantastic just arm of a crinoid that you can see all the little feeding uh, fringes coming off, as well as you, there's another crinoid right here that's kind of closed up. You can see the arms pulled up. And, and there's also, if you look really close, you can see some bryozoans on this as well. So it's, this site has the potential to yield in the future, we suspect, some nice articulated specimens. It just needs more collecting out there. All right. So. And I just wanted to focus in real quick so you guys could see in a little bit better detail that really pretty crinoid arm. And actually, you can see just above it some more bryozoan material right along here. So again, like I said, the potential for preservation on this site could be really good. This is some of the best stuff I've seen in West Virginia in my collecting. All right. That takes us down to the Silurian. Um, I haven't spent a lot of time collecting in the Silurian. There's one section that uh, I would go to about three, four years ago before I started to get into a lot of the Devonian stuff. Probably the best thing I found there are these wonderful straight-shelled cephalopods. This is a, a gorgeous illustration of Michelinoceros, which is a taxon that would be very similar to these. Uh, if anyone knows who created this lovely piece of art, please let me know. I looked all over the web and could not find who the artist was. I would love to be able to put the attribution on this slide. A lot of what we find in these upper Silurian layers tend to be very smashed down assemblages. And it's interesting. So you'll get cases where there's layers of mudstone, like what you see here. Then you'll have uh, shales and then more mudstone. So everything just kind of smashed flat like a pancake. And you can see it's very skeletally dense for the number of invertebrate fossils you see showing up. This piece right here has over 70 brachiopod shells on it. And then this is another great piece right here where it's only about six by six inches. But you can see the number of brachiopods that are preserved on it. They're, they're not well preserved, but you can at least make them out as well as another straight shelled cephalopod. All right. There's just in, in my area, there's not a lot of good Silurian exposure, so I haven't spent too much time in it. Further south of me and a little bit east of me, there's some better stuff. Uh, one thing that West Virginia is actually well known for are our Eurypterid or sea scorpion species. Uh, they're very interesting because they were actually led to suspect, it was thought a long time ago that Eurypterids were primarily freshwater or nearshore environments and that they were what's called a halo tolerant species where you might end up with a greater concentration of salt water because you're in sort of those marginal places. Um, so a lot of these localities where they've been collected were interpreted as being freshwater environments, when in reality, there's been some great work that was done about four years ago in uh, P3 that shows that a lot of these environments are not, in fact, freshwater, but are saltwater environments that had really rapid cycling. And so the, the basically that is lifted to, okay, these things are definitely primarily marine, primarily in uh, saltwater environments. But these are some examples of some wonderful fossils that were found in uh, Hardy County. I don't have a better picture of these Eredeteris uh, claws, but this sketch shows what it would look like. And then this Drapanoteris on the right, this is from the paper that described it in J. Pale, and it's uh, probably one of the best preserved. Uh, we actually tried to go out to one of the fossil sites where Eurypterid material was recovered in the 1910s, uh, very close to us. It's uh, inside when they were cutting out for the Western Rail or Western Railroad System, or sorry, for the Western Maryland Railroad System. Um, unfortunately, we found the path to the railroad system it ended up being a bit treacherous. This shows an example of kind of what we ran into. So this is Nate Van Bracken right here uh, with his dog Allie, and you can see that you know this is our first crossing we went over. Uh, I don't have a picture of the other one, but basically there weren't any of the railroad ties there to go through. So we decided to turn back. Uh, we haven't been trying to go out from the other side yet, but because it's mostly on private land. So we have to work with landowners to get out there. All right. So moving on from the Silurian. Now, the Ordovician is an area that I think could be really, uh, really ideal for future exploration in the state. Um, 
the uppermost layer of Ordovician that's exposed in eastern West Virginia is called the Juniata Formation. Now, it's been hypothesized in Pennsylvania that the Juniata represents a terrestrial site and that the Scolothus uh, burrows that are found there are some of the earliest land uh, mammals, or sorry, some of the earliest land animals coming out and burrowing through. But a lot of people suspect that it's really more of a near shore environment, that these are probably aquatic burrows. And so what I've actually pulled here are some great examples of uh, Scolothos burrows uh, in this picture right here and here from uh, West Virginia. And then this same site doesn't have great preservation of other types of fossils. These are really poorly preserved shells that I've pulled. Um, I don't have a, personally, I don't have an opinion about the terrestrial versus uh, marine nature of the Juniata in Pennsylvania, but I kind of suspect that if it's terrestrial here, or sorry, if it's marine here, it was probably marine there because it would be more likely that we would be terrestrial uh, than they would than marine. All right, Vishian fossils that we've recovered out here. Uh, these are from the Reedsville Shale. They're a bit lower down in section than the Juniata. Uh, so you get some great brachiopods, both uh, rhynchonellids and um, uh, strophominids, as well as some uh, beautiful bryozoans. But what we're really excited about at this same site is on these, they're basically, we find periodically these hard ground plates, and we're not exactly sure, we, these have been collected as float. We're not sure exactly where they've come out from. And they're really neat because one, they're very skeletally dense, uh, and you see, you know, there's the everything you'd normally expect, brachiopods, bryozoans, corals, crinoids, etc. But what's really exciting is that you also see what you see circled right here are, are these really interesting little rings that have this sort of star shape inside them. And, and so when you get those under a lens, what these actually are are edrioasteroids or very early echinoderms, which are related to blastoids and things like that. And these are not actually previously known from the Ordovician of West Virginia. They're, they're very common in upper Ordovician hard ground faunas in uh, Connecticut, sorry, I mean to say Kentucky, Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, et cetera. So we would expect them here, but they've not yet been recovered. And it's interesting that if, the, uh, if this site is correctly identified for its age, these would be earlier than a lot of that material as well. Uh, and then it finally takes us down to the Cambrian. I've not had the opportunity to collect in the Cambrian of uh, West Virginia. And the reality is, unfortunately, the Cambrian exposures are primarily in uh, Harpers Ferry Nat uh, National, uh, National Historic Park. So collecting there is just not going to happen. A lot of the collecting that was done was done in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. And they typically didn't find a lot of well-preserved stuff. It's poorly preserved trilobites, badly preserved brachiopods, and a lot of those scolithos tubes. Now, what's interesting is in the westernmost part of the state, as we get near Kentucky, uh, especially in Wayne County, which is just south of Cabell County, where Marshall University is located, they're doing a lot of fossil uh, fuel exploration, and they're actually pulling out a decent number of microfossils and nanofossils, uh, which if that information could ever be pushed on then to you know, scientific experts, they could probably go through and it would help identify and better understand how some of these layers relate to each other. But as of yet, there's no surface exposures of the Cambrian out there and it's not like, all right. So that kind of concludes our walk through the past and it kind of takes us to the future. And getting into that is kind of where I see opportunities for people like myself to participate across disciplinary lines. So there's three areas that I think are really critical that need to happen uh, in the next like 10 years to basically advance the state of West Virginia paleontology. Uh, and so I'm going to go over these three pieces very quickly, even though this is the area where I get very excited about. All right. The first is basically the, the last time a bibliography of West Virginia geology was completed was in the 1960s. It was a combined effort of geologists who are interested primarily in paleo, uh, paleobotany, like Bill Gillespie, uh, working with WVU because they were trying to get a sense of what their holdings were. Uh, admittedly, it's not even comprehensive. It, it also, there's no annotations or anything that would help make it further useful 
uh, anyone who's ever seen other great annotated bibliographies, such as Daryl Domning's for Cyrenians, knows that these are, can be really useful tools for researchers to understand where they would go. Um, getting this updated would help identify gaps in the geological research of the state. Uh, I've actually noticed just playing on Google Scholar, there's only about 3,100, or sorry, about th only about 3,111 um, uh, entries inside this bibliography. And that probably only represents about 55 to 60 percent of what's what had been published up to the 1960s on the state's geology. So there's some huge gaps. Uh, the other thing is this bibliography would be a great checklist for what's called a CDL library, which I'm going to jump to next. And what that what this is, you're like, what the heck is CDL? Well, CDL stands for Controlled Digital Lending. If you've ever used the Internet Archive or Open Archive, or sorry, open library on the Internet Archive, they have an ability to lend books that typically would be uh, within the copyrighted frame that you couldn't make digitally available. And the way it works is it's radically applying the fair use part of the Copyright Act on the notion of one own, one loan. Is What we like to say is then you basically, you have the right under copy, or the library has the right under copyright to lend as many copies as it physically, or as it owns. So what ends up happening then is under controlled digital lending, which I'm just going to keep calling CDL, you can lend a digital copy as long as you don't lend a physical copy. And so what that means is even if your library is shut down, you can still be lending uh, any digital copies or a digital copy of that item. So it really can open the door in a really radical way for like resource sharing all around the world. Uh, now, in the past, scanning books is very challenging. Now, the uh, rapid book scanners have hit the consumer market. You can get a wonderful one by seizure for under 500 bucks that uh, will do about 300 pages in 20 minutes. All right. So, or I was going to say, so basically using that bibliography of West Virginia resources could be a great right way to go down, see what libraries hold what, and... Um, start digitizing these books, making them available. One of the thing, one of the other advantages is that the more libraries that own these books that partner with the open library, the more digital copies can be made available because it's that same notion of for every owned copy, as long as that physical one's not circulating, you can lend out digital ones as well. So I'm primarily looking at this in West Virginia rare books right now uh, within our library because of COVID unfortunately has made it so that no one can visit our special collections. No one can visit our West Virginia collection. But pursuing CDL in the future could be a way that we would lend these items. And also, then, if CDL was applied to West Virginia geology books, it would be a huge leg up for researchers and for students versus having to go to physical libraries, physical archives to see these items. Uh, the other big unfortunate gap in West Virginia geology and paleontology is often the best most detailed was executed as part of uh, the work by masters and doctoral students in their dissertations and theses. Many of these people went on to work in industry. Uh, often they would just share copies of their work. They didn't see it as something they needed to go ahead and get published. And so there's ba basically that work just sits on a shelf. It's unaccessible. I've actually got I have props three of probably the best dissertations on loan right now from WVU libraries for my area. Uh, what needs to happen is with a lot of these is these collections, whether they're at WVU, Marshall, Virginia Tech, et cetera, need to be digitized and released online. A lot of times, like I said, the authors uh, have passed away. A lot of the works are older than 30 years. Uh, getting these digitized would help a lot of people not start from scratch when researching the area. So, and there's just there's nothing that's really been published or more update than these. Uh, and finally, the one gap that we've really got right now is that there is no clear catalog of the published specimens of West Virginia fossils. Uh, I was, you know, I expected the normal ones such as Carnegie, Cleveland, uh, the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard and Smithsonian have a lot of West Virginia material that was collected in the 1940s, 1950s. And then, of course, as you would expect, WVU and Marshall. Uh, and the West Virginia Geological and Economic Survey have some great fossils as well. 
But there's stuff as far flung away as the Alabama Geological Survey, which you would never think of a place to have West Virginia fossils, or that wonderful uh, fossil fish that's at the University of Kansas. And I actually just recently learned that the State Museum in Charleston, uh, West Virginia, actually has over 10 dozen coal plants that have not been cataloged, nor have they been like described anywhere. So the potential for additional collections of West Virginia material to be hiding out there is, is a big issue. And again, having so having a catalog at least of what's already be done would be a huge benefit for the current researchers and also for starting students. All right. So in summary, and I hope you guys to hang on through this, West Virginia has a great fossil past. Uh, the work is not done. There's so much left to do as I've tried to highlight here. And there's a lot of opportunities right now for everybody who's in GLAM or, you know, libraries, archives, museums, and other higher ed institutions to get together and let's expand access to information to make it easier for the next generation to do this work. Thank you. Okay. Welcome back. All right. Uh, Brittany, your microphone doesn't seem to be working. How about now, everybody? How about now? Not really. Anybody hear me? Barely. I would think we're having tech issues. We might be. Oh, no. Uh, well, okay. For now, Britt, you can try to figure that out, and we can get to some Q&A. You ready, Nick? Yeah. Absolutely. All right, cool. We've got, a, we've got some great questions in the chat. So let's see. First up, we've got Jenny, who's actually joining us from Finland. Uh, Jenny's asking, I'm actually interested to know why Thomas Jefferson thought the bones belonged to a lion. Did he know about the extinct American lion, or were the rumors about lions living in the area? So actually, Thomas Jefferson personally was believed that more or less that life was unchanged through time. So when he saw these, and of course he was not a, while he was an amateur naturalist, he wasn't a comparative anatomist. So when he saw these big claws, his first assumption, let me go back to that slide just so we, there we go. With these big claws, his first assumption was, "Oh, this this is some kind of lion or big cat-like thing." Um, and then, of course, it's funny. He actually asked Lewis and Clark when they started their expedition. There goes my cat. Yep. Um, so to keep an eye out for living specimens of this giant lion creature, as they expected. Unfortunately, uh, he was wrong. There was no giant lion, and there were also no living ground sloths. So I, I hope that answers the question. But it's it's just because of Jefferson's personal beliefs and ideas about how nature worked. That's pretty cool. Can you, there, hear, me, can there's... you hear me now? Sorry. Yeah, I can hear you now. Awesome. Sorry for the technical difficulties, everybody. <laughs> um, there's the, is it a legend or is it a history? I'm not really sure right now. Um, that uh, Tom Jefferson wanted to go out to find living mammoths, mastodons. Brittany, you're the elephant expert. <laughs> That... Thomas Jefferson was kind of obsessed with um, um, the idea of finding giants in the, the North American wilderness. Go ahead, Nick. Oh, I was just going to say, it, it just ties back to that idea of that he just didn't think things could actually go extinct because of how yeah. he, he believed nature worked. I, I've heard that too, though. Awesome. All right. Well, now that everybody can hear my wonderful voice again, um, let's go ahead and look at another question. Uh, this is from Nathan. Do you have any recommendations for fossil hunting locations for amateurs? Um, I'm assuming in West Virginia. Um, if you could, ex if you could speak to collecting practices in West Virginia, that would be for amateurs. That would be great. Yeah. Um, primary, like my primary recommendation one try to be respectful of sites that you go to. Um, it's it's always really tragic when you walk up to a lot of these commonly known road cuts, especially like the one I mentioned at Wardensville, and you can see that somebody just demoed their way through a section and didn't go slow, didn't go carefully, 
didn't look around to see what they might have been able to surface collect at first. You know, best practice is please stick to surface collecting. Please don't dig into the road cuts, for gosh sakes, because we don't need more falling rocks in this state. We are the mountain state, and we'd like our mountains to stay up high. You, you don't need a permit to collect a lot of the material we have. It's primarily invertebrates. Um, it's pretty easy. You know, my recommendation where to start is go basically on the USGS uh, mineral resources uh, mapping site or go onto MacroStrat and use that to get an idea of what kind of, you know, sites might be near you. Or if you go out and drive around and you see a road cut, pull up MacroStrat, or sorry, it's called Rocked when it's on your phone, and see what it might be. Now, my advice for good practice is that when you collect things, um, get an app called Dioptera or some other app that can collect GPS. And please, when you take when you find something, take it before you pick it up, take a picture of where it was at, collect the GPS information on it, so at least that much is known. Like every single like piece of rock, unfortunately, I picked up, I also have GPS for information for, because you know I'm not an invertebrate guy by by any means. And for all I know, something I've picked up could end up being significant for someone later. So my goal has always been make sure I have as much information saved around it as possible. So get, you know, if it's, if it's easier for you to bring a notepad out with you to write down all that stuff, you know, try not to make it about looking for big wins. Try to just enjoy yourself while you're out there. Because when it comes to West Virginia fossil hunting, more often than not, you're going to hit very small stuff. It's not going to be that exciting. Um, for me, I just love being outside, getting the exercise, um, and being out there. So it's you got to change your motivations. It's just not like hunting uh, Calvert Cliffs or something like that in Maryland. One thing for sure, um, if anyone's interested in connecting with other amateur fossil collectors online, uh, you should check out uh, the My Fossil Project, myfossil.org. Um, it's a great place to set up and meet other amateur paleontologists and professional paleontologists. And you can also upload images of your fossil collections and include locality data. And that can help researchers use your fossil collections in their own research. So make sure you check that out if you're interested in using things like that. Yeah, Nathan and I have been talking about getting um, what a lot of what we've collected uh, entered in there just because Honestly, the nice thing is it's, it's almost a great collection management tool for an amateur. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. We Alrighty. train we train our uh, students on uh, on database management by using MyFossil. <laughs> I mean, we haven't been able to do it in a while, but it's great because it's very simplified and they don't mess around with the database. The real I database, I mean. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you um what or, uh, what West Virginia fossil is on the top of your bucket list or anything in particular you really want to find? Oh, wow. Um, you know, not, I, I, I really, part of it is I would love when tramping around these Pennsylvania sites, um, to, and that's Pennsylvania as in the time period, not, you know, the state, obviously, <laughs> uh, I'd love to find some evidence of tetrapod material or some other vertebrate stuff. But on the downside is, um, you know, as long as I keep just finding plant material, you know, I'm, I'm not too worried about it. I, I would love to find some tetrapod stuff, love to find some fish stuff. I, I've been working with a friend um, out in Ohio about the possibility of that unconsolidated Devonian stuff I mentioned. Um, see if I could pull the right slide right off the bat. Yeah, right, perfect, right off the perfect thing. This site here that yields this stuff out, you know, I, I see and collect a lot of this stuff as it rises to the surface as the um, side weathers out and washes out. And he and I have talked about the potential of just shovel, basically going in, carefully shoveling, and trying to keep this the section intact, and then screen washing down sort of the, the type of stuff I'm interested in, which is the invertebrate material, and then sending him that other sediment so he can go look for microfossils, like uh, you know small sharks, small fish teeth that might somehow be present in this mid-Devonian stuff. Cause, Theoretically, they should be around in these marine environments, um, but their fossils are so small, you're not. I'm not going to see them. And when the stuff gets weathered out, they're just going to get washed down into the um, ditch. <laughs> so, that's something I'd like to see happen. I won't be the one, obviously, to discover it, but I'm okay with that. <laughs> if somebody, if I can turn it over to someone who can make it a better use of the data, that just seems like what's right to me. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. it seems like you're very interested in um, having, like, open access and all that free data. Is that, like, a big project for you where you're working at now? Uh, it's, yeah. So I actually meant to mention this when I started. Uh, so uh, there's three things I primarily deal with. Um, one is, whoops. Uh, so I am an instructional librarian primarily. A lot of what I do is working to help community college students develop good research skills, whether that's in a psych class, an English class. I mean, two weeks ago, I was in like 16 different classes, um, just talking about different things, different resources they could use. And my other thing, however, that I'm very involved with is I deal with our archives and special collections at our library. And, and over the past few years, I kind of stumbled into this. And it's very much in the ethos of what I, I, I believed when I was an undergrad student is becoming involved in open collections. And so one of the things that we actually started to deal with is realize is when we're a small staff, uh, we've actually been as low as three staff people in the past five years that I've been there. We're up to finally about five again. Um, we don't have the ability to provide the level of support that individuals need for research uh, into our archives or special collections material. And we don't have the ability to pull somebody off from the front desk area or the service center to go down to the special collections room and sit with somebody. So one of the things that we were getting the most requests for, um, you, you guys might be too young to know what this is, but microfilm uh, in newspapers is to go and pull the microfilm newspaper reels and look for articles. So you'd, you'd put it on the old machine and it rattles along as you look for stuff on the screen. And the reality is we just didn't have the time to keep up with the number of requests. So a director that we had about two directors ago said, you know what, we're going to get this digitized. And that was kind of the start of how I got involved in doing opening up a lot of open collections. And so we started off with what's called the public domain. That's anything that's published before a certain point is fair game under U.S. copyright law. But we started to actually go forward and make connections with, pub with the newspaper publishers in the area to try to provide as much newspaper content that we could going up all the way to the present. And that project has expanded to the other counties in our area. And right now I have a goal of by 2025 to have all 55 counties of our state represented in some way. And it seems like we're in pretty good track for it. We just got a grant to digitize the, uh, sorry, the 1918 pandemic era uh, newspapers. Ooh. So it's gonna do about 44 reels and we're connecting up with the state archives to make a lot of that available. So it's good, we're, we're trying to, we really believe in the idea of openness as a whole. You know, we can't do it all when we're a small staff and we want to basically, you know, it would be more to us to have the information out there, the data, the raw data, whether it's scans of genealogy papers, you know, people's handwritten notes that they collected, et cetera, than for us to necessarily have interpreted around it because we'll never have the time to go through all that material. But if we can at least get it out there, have some solid metadata or information around it to help people search through it, find it, the community will do far more with it than we ever could do sitting in the building. Oh, that's awesome. And that's so yeah. important. Like, with so many folks out there having trouble with access to information, having mm -hmm. projects like this, I think, is just fantastic. Yeah. yeah, we have a brand new director who's only about a year uh, older than me, and he came from archives before, but uh, I actually sent him a copy of what's called the Passenger Pigeon Manifesto, which I know is kind of controversial right now, but it really helped him understand like my personal ethos about openness. And he was like, yeah, like why didn't I think of this before? Like, this just makes sense. We need to make all this stuff out there for people. And so we've actually gotten involved with partnering with the public libraries, um, identifying content that they already have in these non-circulating collections that could be made digitally available. Because as I mentioned before with CDL, if you don't lend that physical book, you can digitally lend it. So we're looking to kind of basically partner up with as many of our public libraries as we can because they have a lot of the same books that we have in our special collections. So yeah. if they partner with us, that means we, instead of it just being our one copy, it could be five copies available for digital lending. So, and again, it's just being open with people. Yeah. And I think that has a nice parallel with what a lot of our museums do with 3D printing, 3D scanning, making scans available online. Um, the Western Science Center 
when we publish a paper, we try to put all the scans available online for free so that people can view them. Um, mm -hmm. So especially in times like these where people often can't go physically see the fossils, I think that has a lot of nice parallels with what you do at the library. Yeah, I, I would totally agree. And it's, um, I, I tend to be pretty radical about openness as a whole. Like I said, if somebody follows me on my Twitter, they're going to basically, <laughs> you're going to get a whole lot of open science, open culture, open stuff shoved down your throat, and I'm not going to apologize <laughs> for it. So <laughs> it, it oh. kills me because oh. really uh, the, the landscape that we have right now, by and large, is everybody could make their research open to some degree. Even if you have to publish, say, in enclosed paywall journals, uh, Green OA lets you take either your preprint or your manuscript copy of an article and, and distribute it that way. So I, I'm pretty radical about this stuff. All right, we're just at the top, almost at the uh, beginning of the hour, so I think we have Great. one more question. Uh, this is from Jenny, uh, which I think will be a fun question. Most common dinosaur fossil in West Virginia? I have no clue. Because I, <laughs> as far as I know, I don't think that any of the cave faunas have fossil birds, mm -hmm. but I could totally be wrong. There's a great new book that's out. Uh, it was published by Springer on the uh, Karst Cave systems uh, throughout the state. Uh, primarily, it's the Bre Greenbrier Caves. Um, I'm not aware that any of the West Virginia cave sites have fossil birds, but that's probably a gap in my knowledge. The Pleistocene is an area I don't, don't know enough about in my state. This whole time, honestly, all I've been thinking about is, like, somebody needs to create a parody of... Oh, wait. What's the name of that song? We were just singing it before we went country, live. Country, the West Virginia home, song. Country Roads. Yeah. Country Roads. Oh, man, I'm so dumb. <laughs> uh, yeah, I feel like somebody should make a paleontology parody of that now. I feel like there's enough information to do that. Yeah, yeah. I sing about giant sound sloths and stuff like that. Yeah, if there's anybody with, mu with uh, both musical and paleontological inclination out there, that idea is they're out there for free now. <laughs> <laughs> How often does uh, that song come up um, coming being from West Virginia, honestly? All the time. <laughs> all the time. You, you gotta I, I used to be one of the people who got frustrated by it, but you've gotta just you gotta learn to love it. <laughs> just lean into it. Yeah, because you're um, not gonna get away from it, that's for sure. No. no. As soon as Nick came on the call, us me and Gabe, us two Californians were like, West Virginia. <laughs> so we apologize for perpetuating. The, <laughs> the song is actually kind of funny because, like, at the museum, um, the our kids. So we're part of a high school. So our students went out for a field trip, right, to collect fossils. And on the field trip, um, they started singing that song. And then you know they get to name localities. So they came back and they're like, "Oh, what did you name these localities where you found these fossils?" We were like, we named this one Country Roads and this one West Virginia because they sang it on the whole trip. And I was like, wow. that's adorable. I'm changing those, but that's cute. <laughs> so nobody so nobody came up with uh, Miner's Lady or Moonshine. That's kind of sad. Yeah. No, not this trip. Yeah. Maybe next one. I'll have to yeah. think of that. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great song. And honestly, as I, whenever I travel away from the state, I, I strangely think about it. Um, it just really embodies, I think, the idea of living in a rural community, you know, when you travel away and coming back. And, and I think that's why the song's so popular and why it resonates with people uh, who aren't even from West Virginia. Yeah. Like, well, oh, speaking go about for that, it. Sorry. Oh, sorry. No, go for right, it. Speaking Dave. about that really quick, how does some, how, how did you go from studying paleontology yeah. to working in a library? That's a great question. Um, so, Personally, I'll just be up front. Uh, I wasn't the best student in uh, school, and I ended up taking some time off of school. I, I went back, got my degree online, but I was looking for job opportunities. And I had previously worked as a student worker in the library about four or five years before. They had a job opening. I got lucky. And I started to realize as I was there that this is something I really enjoyed. And I had I was lucky and had the right bosses that encouraged autonomy, encouraged, hey, you have a good idea, let's go and do that. Um, if I had a more restrictive employer or someone who had a much more narrow view of what librarianship is, 
I I probably wouldn't have stayed there. This probably would have been the career path I'm at. I mean, it's important, I think, for everyone to acknowledge that there, there are times in our life where we just get lucky, and I've been I have been lucky many times. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah, again, we keep talking about it. there's no one path to, you know, be a paleontologist or do paleontology for that matter. So I think it's another great example of how you're using your paleontological knowledge as a librarian now to mm -hmm. educate people about the past and also think about their future. So congrats. Yeah. And, yeah. Some of it also is a uh, liaison work. Um, now that we have a geology professor who's also a paleontologist, um, some of it's just supporting their work as well. You know, we always want to cultivate, even though we're a community college and we're primarily instruction focused, if we have professors who have research interests, whether it's in Gothic literature, Bray Bradbury, things like that, or World War One war stories, or, you know, and in my case, I'm lucky enough to have someone else who likes paleontology, we really want to encourage those people to do research if they want to do research. So, again, I'm just lucky in a lot of ways. <laughs> awesome. Well, I think that's it for us. Thank you so much, Nick, for joining us. Uh, this is really informative, not only about West Virginia fossils, but also about open access and stuff like that. So thank you very much. No problem. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think that does it for today's episode. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, next week, you can join us when Tut Tran from Cal State Fullerton talks to us about his internship at Dinosaur National Monument. Um, I think that's what it is. I wrote the advertise the promo for. I should remember these better. Um, but yeah. So yeah. if you want to catch, if you want to catch more episodes of Fossil Friday Chat, um, make sure you like and subscribe our channel. Turn on notifications for whenever we have a new episode. And if you want to continue to support this program and many others like it at the ALF Museum and Western Science Center, you can find links on how to support us in the description below. All right. Oh, also, and thank you to webcaptioner.com for providing the uh, captions on today's episode. So thank you all so much, and we'll see you next week. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>